Welcome back to the channel. My name is Thomas Fletcher and I'm the host of the Military Social Work Network. If you're new to the channel, please do me a favor by smashing that like button, by subscribing to the channel, and by sharing this video with your social work colleagues and friends. The purpose of this channel is to create a community of hope and support where military and aspiring military social workers can come for relevant news, information, and inspiration. Well, welcome back to our Women's History Month Military Leaders Series. Uh, today's show will be a little bit different because I will not be highlighting uh, an individual person, whereas I will be highlighting um, a branch within the military. So today I will be talking about the United States Army Nurse Corps. And I'm, I'm gonna be talking about it because as I was, as I was preparing for this, this talk, I discovered that uh, the Army Nurse Corps was originally developed uh, primarily for women. You know, um, it, was, it was developed at a time when uh, women could not necessarily serve in combat roles or in other, other traditional male roles within the military, but um, nursing was seen as a vital role that women could play. So we're gonna talk about the Army Nurse Corps, okay? So the United States Army Nurse Corps was formally established by the U.S. Congress in 1901. It is one of the six medical specialty branches or corps of officers, which along with medical enlisted soldiers comprise the Army Medical Department or AMED. The Army Nursing Corps is the nursing service for the U.S. Army and provides nursing staff in support of the Department of Defense medical plans. The Army Nursing Corps is composed entirely of res registered nurses. So the mission of the Army Nurse Corps is to provide responsive innovative and evidence-based nursing care integrated on the Army Medicine team to enhance readiness, preserve life and function and promote health and wellness for all those entrusted to our care. Preserving the strength of our nation by providing trusted and highly compassionate care to the most precious members of our military family, each patient. And let's look at the creed. The Army Nursing Team Creed was written by Lieutenant Colonel McGraw in December 2009. And here it is. I am a member of the Army Nursing Team. My patients depend on me and trust me to provide compassionate and pro proficient care always. I nurture the most helpless and vulnerable and offer courage and hope to those in despair. I protect the dignity of every individual put in my charge. I tend to the physical and psychological wounds of our warriors and support the health, safety, and welfare of every retired veteran. I am an advocate for family members who support and sustain their soldier during times of war. It is a privilege to care for each of these individuals and I will always strive to be attentive and respectful of their needs and honor their uniquely divine human spirit. We are the Army Nursing Team. We honor our professional practice standards and live the soldier values. We believe strength and resilience in difficult times is the cornerstone of Army Nursing. We embrace the diversity of our team and implicitly understand that we must maintain a unified, authentically positive culture and support each other's physical, social, and environmental well-being. We have a collective responsibility to mentor and foster the professional growth of our newest team members so they may mentor those who follow. We remember those nursing professionals who came before us and honor their legacy, determination, and sacrifice. 
We are fundamentally committed to provide exceptional care to past, present, and future generations who bravely defend and protect our nation. So that is the, the Army Nurse Corps Creed. Um, let's get to the history. So let's look at the history. The Army Nurse Corps became a permanent corps of the medical department under the Army Reorganization Act passed by Congress on February 2nd, 1901. So prior to 1901, nurses served in Washington's Army during the Revolutionary War. Although the women who tended the sick and wounded during the Revolutionary War were not nurses as known in the modern sense, they blazed the trail for later generations when in 1873, civilian hospitals in America began operating recognized schools of nursing. After the Revolutionary War, Congress drastically reduced the size of the medical service. Patient care was performed by soldiers detailed from the companies. There was no centralized medical direction by a formally organized medical department until the War of 1812. The Army Medical Department was reestablished by Congress under the direction of a Surgeon General, Dr. Joseph Lavelle. The Army Reorganization Act of 1818 marked the beginning of the modern medical department of the United States Army. Two months after the Civil War began on April 12, 1861, the Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, appointed Dorothea Lind Dix as superintendent of women nurses for the Union Army. Some of the women before reporting for assignment received a short course in nursing under the direction of Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman to receive a medical degree in the United States. Some of the nurses who worked in the Union hospitals were not on the Army payroll, but were sponsored by the United States Sanitary Commission or by volunteer agencies. Their work was largely limited to preparing diets, supervising the distribution of supplies furnished by volunteer groups, and housekeeping duties. During the 1898 Spanish-American War, the Army hired female civilian nurses to help with the wounded. Dr. Anita Newcomb McGee was appointed acting assistant surgeon in the U.S. Army. After the war ended, McGee persuaded the establishment of a permanent nurse corps. She wrote the section of the Army Reorganization Act legislation pertaining to nursing and is now known as the founder of the Army Nurse Corps. In all, more than 1,500 women nurses worked as contract nurses during that 1898 conflict. Race and sex played central roles. The Army Nurse Corps was for white women only and fought, fought hard to exclude or minimize the numbers of black women until 1947. They excluded all men until the Korean War when male doctors began to emphasize the need for nurses in the front lines and this meant male nurses. Interesting. Uh, professionalization was a dominant theme during the Progressive Era because it valued expertise and hierarchy over ad hoc volunteering in the name of civic duty. The Army Nurse Corps became a permanent corps of the Medical Direct Department under the Army Reorganization Act on February 2nd, 1901. Nurses were appointed in the regular Army for a three-year period although nurses were not actually commissioned as officers in the regular army until 46 years later on April 16, 1947. <clears throat> Dita H. Kenny was officially appointed the first superintendent of the Corps on March 15, 1901. Kenny served as superintendent until she resigned on July 31, 1909. The number of nurses on active duty hovered around 100 in the years after the creation of the Corps, with the two largest groups serving at the General Hospital at the Presidio in San Francisco and at the First Reserve Hospital in Manila. 
let's look at World War One. In World War One, the military recruited 20,000 registered nurses, all women, for military and Navy duty in 58 military hospitals. They helped staff 47 ambulance companies that operated on the Western Front. More than 10,000 served overseas, while 5,400 nurses enrolled in the Army's new school of nursing. Key decisions were made by Jane Delano, director of the Red Cross Nursing Service, Mary Adelaide Nutting, president of the American Federation of Nurses, and Anne Goodrich, dean of the Army School of Nursing. Let's look at the period between World War I and World War II. Demobilization reduced the two corps to skeleton units designed to be ex expanded should a new war take place. Eligibility at this time included being female, white, unmarried, a volunteer, and a graduate from a civilian nursing school. In 1920, Army Nurse Corps personnel received officer equivalent ranks and wore Army rank insignia on their uniforms. However, they did not receive equivalent pay and were not considered part of the U.S. Army. Fick, Ficky remained in the Army after the war. After 12 years at Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, D.C., she was promoted to captain and became the assistant superintendent of nurses. <clears throat> She succeeded in creating new billets for occupational therapists and dietitians. Ficky became superintendent with the rank of major in 1938. Let's look at their service during World War II. At the start of the war in December 1941, there were fewer than 1,000 nurses in the Army Nurse Corps and 700 in the Navy Nurse Corps. All were women. Colonel Fickey's small headquarters in 1942, though it contained only four officers and 25 civilians, supervised the vast wartime expansion of nurses in cooperation with the Red Cross. She only took unmarried women aged 22 to 30 who had their RN training from civilian schools. They enlisted for the war plus six months and were discharged if they were married or pregnant. Due to the Japanese attack of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, the United States entered the Pacific part of World War II. Along with this military effort was the work of the Flying Tigers in Kunming, China under Claire Chenault. Nurses were thus needed in China to serve in the U.S. Army. These nurses were recruited among the Chinese nurses residing in China particularly the English-speaking nurses that fled Hong Kong, which was a British colony at the time, to free China due to the Japanese invasion of Hong Kong on December 8, 1941. The Hong Kong nurses were trained by the Department of Medical Services, directed by Dr. Percy Selwyn Selwyn Clark of the government of Hong Kong. They took up nursing positions at the Flying Tigers, only a few African-American nurses were admitted to the Army Nurse Corps. Mabel Keaton Stoupers, who worked for the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, with help from Eleanor Roosevelt, pressured the Army to admit African-American nurses in 1941. The first black nurse admitted to the program was Della H. Rainey, who was commissioned as a second lieutenant in April 1941. The limit on black nurses was 48 in 1941, and they were mostly segregated from white nurses and soldiers. In 1943, the Army set a limit on black nurses to 160. That same year, the first African-American medical unit, the 25th Station Hospital Unit, was deployed overseas to Liberia. Later, nurses were deployed to Burma, where they treated black soldiers. African-American nurses also served in China, Australia, New Guinea, the Philippines, England, and in the United States where, where they treated prisoners of war. 
By the end of the war, there were 476 serving in the Corps. Wow. On February 26, 1944, Congress passed a bill that granted Army and Navy nurses actual military rank approved for the duration of the war plus six months. With over, six, with over 8 million soldiers and airmen, the needs were more than double those of World War I. Hundreds of new military hospitals were constructed for the expected flow of casualties. Fearing a massive wave of combat casualties once Japan was invaded in late 1945, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt called on Congress early in 1945 for permission to draft nurses. However, with the rapid collapse of Germany early in 1945 and the limitation of the war in the Pacific to a few islands, the draft was not needed and was never enacted. By the end of the war, the Army and the Army Air Forces had 54,000 nurses and the Navy 11,000, all women. Some 217 black nurses served in all black Army medical units. The Army Air Force was virtually autonomous by 1942 and likewise its nurse corps. Much larger, nurse, much larger numbers of enlisted men served as medics. These men were in effect practical nurses who handled routine care under the direction of nurse officers. Likewise, many enlisted WACs and WAFs served in military hospitals. Medical advances greatly increased survival rates for the wounded. 96% of the 670,000 wounded soldiers and sailors who made it to a field hospital staffed by nurses and doctors survived their injuries. Amputations were seldom necessary to combat gangrene. Penicillin and sulfur drugs proved highly successful in this regard. Nurses were deeply involved with post-operative recovery procedures, air evacuation, and new techniques in psychiatry and anesthesia. Under Colonel Fiki's Upon Colonel Fiki's retirement in 1943, she was succeeded by Florence A. Blanchfield, who successfully promoted new laws in 1947 that established the Army, Navy, and Air Force Nurse Corps on a permanent basis, giving the same terms as male officers. A month before she retired in 1947, Blanchfield became the first woman to hold a regular Army commission. I am gonna stop there but um, it's interesting to to look at the history of the Army Nurse Corps um, because at, because as as everything in the military now it's it's a completely integrated service where men and women serve together um, but like a lot of like a lot of parts of our military uh, history at one point it was actually created for women so and women served valiantly you know they took care of you know women have been taking care of our wounded warriors again since the Revolutionary War um, and unfortunately you know until the end of World War II they didn't receive um, the same rank the same compensation but nevertheless they showed <clears throat> what this channel is all about inspiration you know they served with with honor and 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 determination and excellence and so i, I just wanted to talk about the army nurse corps and its its beginnings um, because if it wasn't for all those women who stepped up to the plate it might not be the great um the great specialty branch that that it remains today so i just wanted to uh to give that highlight and that inspiration. Um, I want to thank you all for watching this video. For all the social workers out there, thank you for the work that you do every day for your clients, for your agency, and for the profession. Please continue to support each other and yourselves. Bye for now.